good afternoon everyone we warmly welcome you to the webinar today this is our fifth webinar in a series of webinar organized by sri lanka veterinary association today our topic is disease challenges in poultry production role of vaccines vaccination and pathogens so our today guest speaker is dr dilan satrasinghe is a renowned scientist poultry in poultry sector and a molecular biology virology and especially he is involved in covid-19 testing with respect to animals this is and he is a senior lecturer in the faculty of veterinary medicine and animal science and a consultant veterinarian in grand parent breeder flocks in sri lanka and is also the vice president of slva and uh, let me introduce the sri lanka veterinary association first this association was founded in 1940 our first president was dr r j little and since then this is our 73rd executive committee and uh, at the present we have 1208 members in this association who are living in sri lanka and abroad as well and as i know there are so many vets joining in today especially young vets those who have passed out recently and uh, there may be students finally students undergraduates as well so we invite you all to join slva uh, as members and strengthen up this organization and work for the profession and uh, if i mention this bit of about objectives of this association this is a forum for discussing technical socio economical and policy issues of importance of veterinary field igor man facilitate dissemination of knowledge information among vets promote and advance the role of veterinarians and involve in and intervene in developing policies related to veterinary profession promote appropriate partnerships with like minded bodies maintain honor and dignity of the veterinary profession safeguard the interest and welfare of members so before moving into the today's session our president of sri lanka veterinary association is with us i would like to invite our president dr erandika gunadana to welcome you all thank you dr erandika over to you dr erandika you are mic off off yeah dr disney can you hear me yeah yes 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 uh, yeah so thank you very much dr disnaka for your introduction actually he you explained a uh, bit things about the selvis i don't have to explain further and without much delay i just warmly welcome you all today for this uh, our fifth seminar conducted by our own colleague uh, dr dilan satrasinghe is a very prominent uh, figure in this particular field of poultry science so today the global challenges and the important of vaccines and their roles and and pathological approaches for this uh, series of poultry uh, science Uh, so actually we as the slva we conducted uh, two three seminars in the in the beginning uh, before the covid 19 waves but uh, we had to shift for this uh, webinar series i mean uh, through online uh, under the zoom platform uh, as the new normal situation in the country as well so i warmly welcome my teachers and my dear colleagues and senior veterinarians in the particular field of poultry i know there are past presidents also joined in this forum today and uh, especially friends from the overseas today and the young vets students uh, for this important webinar today and uh, with a series of activities and, uh, and again I, i would like to remind you to uh, our colleagues to to uh, update your memberships uh, with the slva because we are we are we can then, then we can give you more services uh, to upgrade the standards of the uh, vet country veterinarians so uh, without taking much delay today i warmly welcome you all for this seminar and i would like to hand over the uh, the, the forum to our prof uh, the, our dr dilan satrasinghe please thanks thank you dr randika uh, small uh, notice for you all so today seminar today webinar will be two hour session 
and uh, first one and a half hours will be a, a lecture done by dr dilan and after that a uh, half an hour discussion ses session will be followed and meanwhile i request kindly from you all to keep your mics and camera off and uh, during discussion time you can uh, raise hand or you can switch on your mic and directly ask questions and uh, uh, with that i would like to invite uh, our secretary dr sugat premachandra to introduce our presenter today thank you dr sugat thank you very much uh, dr jishnakar uh, good afternoon everyone uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our uh, resource person today dr dilan amil satar singh dr dilan satar singh graduated from the faculty of veterinary medicine and animal science university of peradeniya in 2006 uh, he worked as the head of operation fortune gp farm private limited from 2006 to 2009 He joined the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Science, University of Peradeniya, in 2009. He obtained a Master of Veterinary Medicine in Bio Biosecurity from Massa University, 2012, New Zealand. In 2016, he obtained the PhD in Immunology at the University of Putra, Malaysia. Presently, he works as a senior lecturer, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, at the university of peradeniya uh, his research interest including characterization and understanding of the immunopathogenesis of pathogens that directly impact food security and food safety he collabor collaboratively worked with the animal production industry to strengthen sustainable production and distribution network he was the first to identify the molecular character characterize the different virus genotypes involved in newcastle disease okay. and chicken okay. anemia disease in sri lankan poultry industry <coughs> his res his research outcomes were published in high impact scientific journals and he obtained presidential award from high impact scientific publications from 2016 onwards further he works as a reviewer in top rank international peer reviewed journals in the field of virology and molecular biology since 2016 he has been able to secure international and nation, uh, national grant worth 86.4 million to establish a modern laboratory equipped for molecular diagnosis of animal disease at faculty of veterinary medicine and animal science and currently offering the service to the industry for diagnosing poultry diseases in addition this lab offer service for the detection of covid-19 in animals and humans dr dilan satar singh has participated as the invited speaker in many local con conference and international scientific conferences organized by world veterinary poultry association and world poultry association he has more than 15 years of teaching research and work ex working experience in grand parent parent and commercial operation management in poultry industry dear dr dilan satar singh i would like to invite you to continue the program Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sugar, our secretary, Sri Lanka Veterinary for your nice and detailed introduction. And uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, let me share my screen. Hope you all can see my screen. Dr. Suga, yes, yes, we can see your screen. Yes. Okay. So today we are going to discuss the disease challenges in poultry production, role of vaccines and vaccination and pathogens. So basically, as a, a person who is working in the industry and also involved in research and the teaching. 
my uh, first priority in the poultry is actually we i believe the prevention not actually the cure much but uh, the prevention is uh, very much cheaper when it comes to the production systems especially in the poultry so when we uh, prioritize the main activities as veterinarian we do in uh, prevention basically uh, without any hesitation we have to take the biosecurity the mega dermity that all type of uh, practices practices we implement in the farms at, at the conceptual level and the structural level and the operational level so the practical approach of uh, stopping the diseases this re reduce the disease burden to the bird so this is the number one priority when it comes to disease control the second one actually the effective vaccination program especially the uh, infectious diseases and uh, selecting of the proper vaccine the vaccination program and its application so third one we can take the medication so as veterinarians we uh, use various combinations but we as veterinarian who actually work in the industry with the entrepreneurs irrespective of their scale like large medium and small scale of operation we have to admit that prevention is better than actually it's the cheapest method of uh, intervening the veterinary tools to the uh, increase productivity of the production systems so let me uh, look at this uh, balance between the infection and the immunity so it is always a balance that we talk about and uh, it's one side we take the infection and other side the immunity so how we maintain the balance the impact of the disease actually always based on the the dose of infection or the amount of quantity of the virus or any other pathogen that can the birds can expose so by having a practical approach in the biosecurity program we can reduce the uh, amount or the uh, frequency of exposure and also the pathogen the virulence of the pathogen associated with the infection is very important to determine the impact or the severity of the disease and uh, also the vaccination the host immunity how the host or the uh, bird going to handle this uh, virulent pathogen and also the amount of infection so this is actually a work in the equilibrium and the one side if it is behavior that means if it's infection side the infection quantity and the virulence of the pathogens overcome the immunity of the host definitely it will initiate the infection in the host so when it comes to the viruses we face a lot of ch challenges including the current covid-19 pandemic in human so it changes their antigens and epitope very frequently and they are masters on it and evade host natural and vaccine induced immune response they always try to go through this our host responses triggered by the immune response inhibiting the humoral response mainly through the antibody mediated immunity and the inhibiting inflammatory responses other innate immune responses the non specific responses triggered by the host immune system and the blocking antigen processing and presentation the entire mechanism that work under the immune system how how they have been processed by the macrophages and the dendritic cells and present to the immune system so always the viruses are masters on change in their patterns and the invasion mechanism and working on the evasion of the host immune system and finally they also look at how they can suppress the host immune re response uh, and trigger their infection so let's state the four factors which interfere with vaccine and exposure in poultry so first we take the bird factor so there are four different bird factors that we should think about uh, impact on the vaccine efficacy first one is the maternal immunity uh, maternal immunity is actually the presence of high level of antibodies uh, maternal antibodies live vaccines administered during the first two weeks of life may be neutralized because of the high level of maternal antibodies coming through from the parents it depends on the parents vaccination program and also the various other immunosuppressive diseases like infectious bursal disease the infectious anemia and the marks so those diseases can be present in the birds and it will reduce the immune response in the bird so the vaccination program will be affected from those and the health status of the bird so during the vaccination the healthy bird might incubate certain pathogens and then the vaccine vaccine will not be effective and certain uh, genetic strains and variants are they are most susceptible sometimes to certain diseases so these are the four main factors that we have to think about the bird flock 
uh, and the birds uh, side when we think about the vaccine efficacy. The second one is the management conditions, how well we manage the farm and what about our uh, cleaning and disinfection program in the farm and how you are going to clean the houses and maintain the uh, hygiene in the farm. This is very important because if we are not practicing proper biosecurity and hygiene in the farms that will create more virus or the pathogen burden to the birds that will lead to the finally having infection. The third factor is the selection of the vaccine, proper vaccine. So based on the infectious agents associated with the disease, we have to select the proper vaccine and it should be able to neutralize the field, field challenge. So the selection of the vaccine and the level of protection that you are going to achieve. So it depends on the field of viruses circulate surrounding the birds, depends on the virulency and the, the in infectivity of those viruses. Always think about the field challenges. So these are main points that we have to think about uh, selecting the vaccine and vaccine program. And finally, how we can administer this va vaccine. So you can select the best vaccine in the world and you can expect the best level of protection, but the way you handle the vaccine and the way you inject the vaccine is very critical to induce proper immunity against the diseases. So handling certain live vaccines like cell mean and Marek's disease vaccines, it's very prone to have very uh, prone to destroy in the environment temperature. So proper handling and proper administration within the time period is very important to maintain the livability of the vaccine and expected outcomes. And the diluent or the media used, the way you are doing the vaccine. So if you are looking for a very high herd immunity or the frog immunity, so selection of the route of the vaccine. So that depends on the field challenges and the burden of the diseases present in your area. So the, always we have to think about the route that we are going to uh, use the vaccination and the association. So certain like the recently we have a lot of recombinant vaccines combined with HVT herpes virus and the pox virus. So, and also we have certain uh, normal diseases caused by pox and the HVT. So this, when you have the combinations of virus vaccines, we need to think about the interactions and the manufacturer's uh, recommendations on those vaccines. So there can be interactions and can cause a partial uh, immun immunity in the host. So based on our uh, my experience, actually, today I have prioritized four viral diseases uh, that affects the poultry industry in Sri Lanka, either layer or broiler industry, even in the back cat. Uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, we have uh, infectious bronchitis virus, cases and the Newcastle disease and the chicken anemia, it is quite uh, commonly reported. And also the very recently in the meat type uh, chicken, the broilers, the file adenovirus causing inclusion body hepatitis more commonly reported and most of the uh, losses in the system, the production uh, caused by uh, these diseases. So let's, uh, we think about this, how uh, viruses change their, uh, or the evade their evade the immune mechanism uh, triggered by us. So as far as uh, up to today, we in Sri Lanka, we have not reported any avian influenza cases, but avian influenza is one of the virus disease that is very causing pandemic and it was the most uh, uh, very popular topic before the COVID-19. And uh, they, this virus undergo the uh, antigenic drift and the shift, the smaller level changes with the mutations and also the large level changes in between different host, swine, avian, and human, and change in the hemagglutination uh, and neuramidase antigenic uh, epitopes. So this, uh, this was the major menace faced by the scientists and the poultry in the world past, and still it's going on. And when it comes to the Sri Lankan situation, we, we have our infection bronchitis and Newcastle disease. And uh, we took the, these two viruses actually, those are RNA viruses. So now we are experiencing another RNA virus. It's keep on changing. Uh, we are talking about the new mutated strains and the mutation speed. So as poultry veterinarians, we are talking about this more than now four or five decades because now with the RNA derived 
viruses, they don't have a proofreading ability. When they replicate, they don't check that they have say, transcribed the same or translated the same type of uh, genetic mm -hmm. material to trans trans the next progeny. So there are error prone amplification. Error prone amplification can cause mutations in the next uh, or the progeny of the virus. And most of those viruses will not survive. But however, due to these variations in the replication, what will happen is if they find a stable virus and a new host, they try to jump to the new host and get stabilized. So you can see we this kind of uh, actions, actually of the species, we call it as quasi-species, especially IB and ND we, viruses, we consider it as quasi-species. And as you can see the diagram, how uh, it's the, the mutation rate is 0 0.05. And the, it's not the survival of the fittest. This is the Darwin's theory, actually. It's survival of the fittest. So they try to have more variations. And what's going to happen is if that variation in the virus is stable, and if it contains the infectivity, then they try to find a new host with the new mutations, and they can change the virulency as well. So, Past two studies actually uh, it is uh, published, and uh, this uh, IBV also they are uh, also have uh, this error prone ability because it's a RNA virus. Uh, and uh, when we administer the vaccines, vaccines actually we introduce the pressure to the field viruses as well. Due to this uh, error prone abilities, the vaccine uh, genetic material RNA and also the field strains can combine and come up with the new. A virus strain. So it is always the bioinformatic tools used in these two studies showed that there are certain uh, virus strains reported in the field isolated from the carcasses. Actually, they had some parental lineage from the vaccine plus the field strain, so mix of genetic material. So actually applying the vaccines and without having the proper uh, titus, the field strains might penetrate through the host immune response. So this might trigger certain recombination event in this RNA derived viruses. So this is actually happened in IB and also with ND. So let's look at the challenges from IBB from chicken farming. So now we have to look at this uh, path we are taken by the infectious bronchitis virus. Initially it was discovered in 1930 as a classical IB and first reported in US. Then uh, 1940, we, uh, the clinicians, they saw that the uh, symptoms of the clinicians in the kidney. So they characterized nephropathogenic strain in Australia. So this virus mainly came as a respiratory disease. Then they show the symptoms of the clinical lesions in the kidney. So that means the virus, they, have, they are infecting to the kidney as well. In 1950, this caused a uh, problem in the uterus and deteriorating the egg quality of the layers. So then IBV. So the, in another clinical symptom we characterize, it can deteriorate the quality of the layers. In 1960, IBV strains causing problem in the intestine. So slowly the virus, what is doing, they actually expand the system that they can infect. So now it has come to the GIT. In 1990, IBV strain causing deep muscle myopathy also. And finally into the 2040, IB is strain causing water belly and ascites in the layers. So this shows that how this IB, the same uh, virus, change with the time and cause uh, lesions in the different uh, systems and different organs and how they have changed the tropism. So the normal viruses, they actually attack, go and attach with the receptors. So initially they have the affinity towards certain receptors and with gradually with the infection and the evasion of the immune response, then if they want to evade the immune response, they try to change their tropism of the affinity and go towards the other uh, organs. So this, this, is, this is the clear story that we can see, this kind of mechanism uh, triggered by this uh, gamma coronavirus IBV. So, so basically we look at the, uh, in, in our vaccine play programs, uh, we look at this classical mass type IB vaccination initially in the poultry, but with these changes we observed in this uh, field. So we think about having and characterizing uh, the virus. Are they having any mutations in the virus and can cause 
different type of infection in different organs and tissues. So basically, as a result, we are the, we identified the variant uh, type of uh, IBE oh, strains wonderful. in the field. So this is a similar study conducted in Malaysia. Because in 2010 to 2013, they were having very big uh, outbreak in the poultry industry. And as a result, the, the team of the scientists in UPM, uh, we actually uh, categorized or the characterized the molecule, characterized the IB with more than 20 IB strains isolated from 1995 to 2015, and realized that not only the classical strain of IB, in the Malaysia, there are due two different variants like QX-like and the 793B-like. Various strains are present in the country. And they also analyzed the homology of the vaccine strains with this variant type of strains. And they found that the, the vaccine strains and the, the antigenic protein of the spike protein of these viruses are having quite diff different type of homology, like 70%. And so 30% variation can be observed. And when it comes to Sri Lankan situation, in 2012, of Ganapati from uh, Liverpool University, he has actually obtained certain samples from Sri Lankan uh, faulty industry. And he actually uh, detected the, and sequenced the spike protein and uh, find, found that in Sri Lanka also, having this uh, 793B variant group, apart from the uh, mass type or classical variant group, so at that time, we were actually uh, uh, using the uh, classical type, mass type vaccination in the industry, but we found a lot of uh, vaccine induced failures, even vaccinated flocks were infected from IB. And uh, this was the quite uh, straightforward evidence showing that uh, at that time, Sri Lanka, there were um, variant type uh, IB uh, strains circulating and infecting uh, uh, poultry. And thereafter, actually, the introduction of the uh, avian uh, vaccine strains uh, need to be done and already initiated and to control the IB infection in the country. So now let's look at the NDV of uh, virus infection in chicken farming. So as I mentioned you earlier, with this deep sequence platforms also, the NDV virus, Newcastle disease virus, was determined as the one of the quasi species that undergone this uh, mutations and changes, because we know that uh, Newcastle disease virus is minus one zero type. And theoretically, uh, we should be able to get the protection from the whatever the genotype uh, vaccines that we are using. but. Interestingly, this is another study conducted with the uh, five different uh, isolates uh, from 2004 to 2013 obtained from the Malaysia poultry industry. And we found that the, at the later period, like 2014 15, there were uh, an exchange of uh, genetic material from the vaccinated strain, which is genotype 2, vaccination, Lasota, and other type of genotype 2 vaccines, and the genotype 7. Uh, viruses. So this kind of uh, exchange of genetic material between the vaccine viruses and the field viruses. It was obvious and also when it comes to Sri Lanka, we also conducted the same study and we, we actually observed certain model, you know, up to three to five percent in the commercial layers, uh, though they are vaccinated from live and the killed vaccines. And we found that Sri Lanka also contains genotype 7 viruses in the field and uh, it has been categorized as genotype 7 and these virus, uh, viruses isolated from Sri Lanka showed a remarkable like 23% deviation from genotype 2 vaccine strain. So normal the Lasota VGG, so 23% deviation from the, those are not actually 100% homologous to the vaccine strains. And further, with this finding, uh, the scientists they uh, went for pathogenicity studies in genotype seven uh, virus infection because it, it was the predominant type of uh, genotype predominant genotype circulated in the Asia and Southeast Asia. <laughs> because of that, they they uh, they tried to understood the uh, 
pathogenicity or the molecular pathogenicity of the this genotype 7 uh, Newcastle disease virus. And if they found that actually not only the viremia or the infection caused this death of the birds, it's about uncontrollable uh, level of immune response coming from the host. That means sometimes when you trigger the immune response by the viruses, it is too much to the body and it causes damage to our own cells or the tissues. So certain uh, chemicals triggered from the immune response, we call it as chemokines and the cytokines. So those chemicals actually initiate the inflammatory reactions and it is triggered with the uncontrollable way and that is the organs and the tissues causing the death of the host or the bird. So they investigate actually what is uh, happening behind this genotype 7 infection. So these are the typical gross lesions that we can see. Uh, this is actually uh, one of the experiments uh, we conducted uh, inducing the uh, genotype 7 uh, Newcastle disease in uh, SPF chickens, uh, specific pathogens in chicken. And this actually paper was presented in, as an invited paper in the World Veterinary Report in 2018. And, uh, here I have done a comparison between the uh, virus copy number, uh, what will happen once you in, uh, in challenge with the genotype 7 and other velogenic Newcastle diseases. So another genotype is genotype 8. You can see this is the genotype 8 virus and all three other, all other three uh, strains belongs to genotype 7. So you can see irrespective of the system, even respiratory tract, and the GIT duodenum, both we can see this virus, you know, type seven and eight can cause the uh, replication, can trigger the replication. And this is the viral copy number isolated, right? And observed, detected in the real time PCR. So after 24 hours of infection to challenge the virus, so this genotype seven virus can be seen in the lungs. So C not zero or 12 hours. After first zero, just after the infection, you can't see the virus in the lungs. After 12 hours, we can't see the, the virus in the uh, uh, lungs. It depends on the sensitivity of the PCR. At 24 hours, so all genotype seven viruses can be observed. It has already replicated. And uh, interestingly, at 36 hours only, we detected the other velogenic genotype eight, uh, the red color one. At the, so a little bit, I mean, this rep replication-wise in the lungs, the genotype is more efficient compared to the compared to this other velogenic genotype eight virus. So, and also the, the viral copy number, the I mean, number of viral copy or the viruses present in the lungs, it is quite high compared to the genotypes eight uh, or the velogenic other type virus strain. So that, mean, that tells us. This genotype 7 virus are more efficiently replicate in the lungs as well as also in the duodenum. So that means that this genotype 7 viruses, this characterized by strains, can cause the problem in the, both in the GIT and the respiratory tract. So they both show the pneumotrophic and the um, isotrophic nature of the virus. Then we actually examine the uh, expression of the innate immune response, non-specific immune response coming from through the interferon alpha. So interferon alpha is one as antiviral uh, cytokine and fight against the virus infection. And we observed that the genotype 7 and the 8, when you compare the genotype 8 virus, actually the red color, induction of interferon alpha is quite prominent compared to the genotype 7, that means soon after the challenge with genotype 7 and 8. So we see the genotype 8 trigger the secretion of interferon alpha from the host immune response as a, as a result of a host immune response. And this interferon alpha actually acts as the antiviral, antiviral immunity. So this is quite interesting. You can see with the viral copy number present in the lungs and the duodenum, and the reaction coming from the host is telling because antiviral response coming from the host for genotype 7 inf infection quite a little bit late when we compare the 
interferon alpha, which allows virus to replicate in the system more easily. So other type one interferon, interferon beta is the same. And also the expression of interferon beta, we didn't see much difference between the genotype seven and eight, but still in both lungs and genome, this antiviral response triggered. Then evaluate the, what will happen, this cell mediated immunity, the TH like the T helper cells actually, play a major role in the immune system. They are actually the helper, helping arm of the, this humorality and the cell mediated immunity. So the T helper cells play a bigger role, very vital role in immune response. So we, we, try, to we try to analyze the involvement of TH1 like towards cell mediated immunity following the genotype seven and genotype eight infection. So then we realize in the lungs and the diurnum, significantly we can see difference between genotype seven and eight. So the genotype seven trigger more cell mediated immune response, TH like, -like through this interferon gamma, gamma. So you can see red color and bars are low after 12, 24, 48, 72 hours of post inoculation. So instead of the red color, you can see these shades of green, uh, blue, and these are the, the peaks are high. That means uh, secretion of interferon gamma is more uh, potent in uh, lungs and urinum when they are infected with the genotype seven viruses compared to the genotype 10 velogenic in these strains. Then we look at the same uh, TH like one like cytokine expression, the interleukin 12 alpha, and they are also in the lungs and urinum. Uh, we see the same type of, irrespective of the genotype, same type of uh, anti uh, viral response coming through the cell mediated immunity were observed. And uh, the flow inflammatory cytokine, the interleukin 8. So, this is one of the cytokine that trigger most of the inflammatory reactions, inflammatory reactions in the body. So in the both duodenum and the lungs, we can see the lungs, of course, with the different types of strains, the genotype, uh, irrespective of the genotype, the triggering or the initiation of the secretion of interleukin-8 is more or less similar, I red color and the blue color. But when it's come to the duodenum, we observe the genotype-7 infection cause more pro inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-8 sec secretion from the host compared to the other genotype. So that means this four immune cytokines trigger actually the uh, concentration of the nitric oxide present in the blood, which is an endothelial vasodilator. And these all inflammatory cells will be uh, relocated to the site of infection and you will have these inflammatory reactions in the body after that. So, and also other than the T helper, uh, type, T helper type one reaction, we look at the T helper two like cytokine reactions triggered by the leukin 10. There also we have seen the significant variation with genotype seven and eight. You can see uh, the blue color shades, actually their peaks are higher than the genotype eight, the red color uh, peaks. So this actually uh, ended up with uh, a story telling that genotype seven triggered the, uh, seven triggered cytokine storm, uncontrollable uh, cytokine uh, secretions uh, from the body, irrespective of the tissue, whether it is a lung or DNA, especially in the GID, leading to the, uh, leading to the uh, damage to the uh, organs and the cells that ultimately uh, the reason for the death of the birth. So this actually for the poultry, you know, the paramyxovirus which is well studied in human medicine, human virology, and the Newcastle disease belongs to paramyxo, uh, even paramyxo virus C type 1. Uh, so uh, it, it is well known that uh, these paramyxo viruses, they have mechanism to evade host immune response and they try to mask the uh, pathogen recognition receptors uh, until they uh, multiply. So the body can't detect the presence of the virus. It can't detect the presence of the virus. Therefore, the body response against the viral infections will be sluggish, slow, as a res uh, result, this viral infection, what is happening is they freely replicate inside the body with the affected organs. And when the body realizes with the higher concentration of virus load, it is too late to respond by the immune system. So it was quite obvious with these uh, findings we have seen. 
And these are the actually uh, some histopathological change happens in the lungs and the duodenum. And you can see the infiltration of the uh, lymphocytes and uh, cells responsible for inflammation to the lung tissue and the duodenum tissue. And it was really a, a uh, results of the cytokine storm, uncontrollable cytokines come into the uh, come into the play, uh, role and attract in the uh, related uh, say, uh, immunomodulated cells that can trigger the uh, immune response. Okay, so now we the, let's take the different approach, a different disease. So don't, now, just for a short time, uh, switch off the heart. Now we are talking. We're going to go for our third topic, challenges from uh, chicken anemia virus. This is a DNA virus, one of the most smallest virus uh, in the faulty infection, right? But it's quite harsh virus to deal with. So we are not talking about here the recombination or any mutations, but to understand this uh, virus, uh, we though it is very small, it causes a lot of damage to the whole industry if, if you are not handling, if we are not going to handle it properly. So mainly it causes immune suppression. Then what will happen is it will act as a silent killer. It will act as a silent killer. We don't know it's coming. And whatever the vaccination program or vaccine that you have selected it for a flock with the infection of chicken anemia, it won't work because it, the, it already, the chicken anemia virus has been suppress the immunity of the host or the chicken. So whatever the vaccine program that we are going to introduce, it will not trigger the host immunity. Because already host immunity has been compromised by the infection. So other interesting stories, this literally just says this virus actually the very resistant to chemical and physical agents. It's resistant against 90% acetone for 24 hours, resistant against the pH 3 for three hours, commercial disinfection bases like soap, not effective, resistant against heat at 8 centigrade for 15 minutes. So this shows that the farm has been infected with this very small but silent killer, right? So how difficult for us to get rid of this disease. So it's a silent killer in the production system. And Basically, uh, we can see up to the three weeks, this infection, it affects to the uh, production of the uh, poultry. But the, in the, at the parent level, at the parent level, when they are uh, at the laying stage, uh, this, they cannot get the infection, but there will be inf uh, no clinical symptoms, no clinical symptoms. Uh, since they don't have uh, enough uh, antibodies against or the immune response against the virus infection, the CAV, they might get the disease and they, they will be asymptomatic, but they pass this virus to the next progeny. And the young chicks, little than three weeks, get the clinical disease that is the vertical transmission. The horizontal transmission, the parents of without antibodies against CAV, what is happening is they will actually, they are, they all chicks will have chicken anemia virus, the antibodies, not up to the uh, protection level, not up to the protection level. So if the commercial layer or the broiler farmer is having this disease contaminated and not properly disinfected, what will happen is these partially immunized birds, they, still know. Know, they will be exposed to the, uh, this disease in the farm. Then the lateral, so the horizontal transmission will happen and that can cause the losses of the model in the chicken. So basically we see the gross lesion, the anemia, thymus atrophy, hydropericardium, and the watery blood when you do the postmodern and uh, hemorrhages, subcutaneous hemorrhages, the hemorrhages in the tip of the wings, bone marrow aplasia, and the pterotic spleen. So those are the common lesions that we can find. And sometimes we see this one, uh, this problem in Sri Lanka, in certain uh, areas of the country, uh, especially at the jig stage of the lay and the broiler. So we also obtain like uh, 25 samples from broiler and the layers. Uh, they both both broiler and the layers are not vaccinated, right? But they were showing sort of some similar symptoms because suspecting the chicken anemia virus infection from Western and Northeast province of Sri Lanka. And we, we detected the virus, uh, mainly we extracted from the bone marrow, and we detected those uh, 
uh, this chicken anemia virus, these, these flocks are not vaccinated. Uh, so this is the infection, infect, uh, infection is going on in the field. And uh, by using the VP1 gene, partial gene sequencing, we have developed the, the constructor polygenetic tree. So uh, in, the, in the public domain, I can obtain only the Nobilis P4 vaccine uh, gen uh, genome. And I compared with the uh, other, other uh, local uh, strains or the VP1 gene sequence. And we don't see much deviation because we should not worry about the deviation. Also, it's a DNA virus. There's error. We don't have uh, error-prone ability in uh, replication of DNA viruses. They are, actually they have proofreading ability. So we are not talking about the recombination or any deviation from the vaccine strains here. What we have to think about the correct protection level and the strategy that we have to adhere in in controlling this disease because this can cause uh, millions of trillions of losses to the industry. The fourth very interesting disease, inclusion in body hepatitis uh, in broilers. In broilers, challenge from uh, foul adenovirus for poultry. This is one of the hot topic in Sri Lanka now. And this also affects the first five weeks of the life of the broilers. And we have to admit that it is more prominent when our chicks or chickens are commonly associated with immunosuppression. Immunosuppression. So we should think both. Why we get this disease? Is there any uh, factor associated with the immunosuppression? Why this phylogenovirus is more prominent and causing disease in the poultry? And in the fifth day, uh, this disease can come to the peak level and cause the highest uh, losses to the farmer. And the pale liver, the bleeding, necrosis, the water like in the pericardial sac, the granular stomach swelling, those are the common, common lesions that we can see in the field. And uh, as veterinary areas, we, we need to understand this phenomena. The all foul adenovirus belongs to the avian adenovirus genus, and they are divided into five species, foul adenovirus A, B, C, D, and E. And under these five species, we have identified 12 different serotypes, 12 different serotypes. So serotypes are very important when it comes to the vaccination because there might be cross protection be among serotypes or between serotypes, but one vaccine normally work with the one serotype, one serotype. So here we can see, so the foul adenovirus species A includes foul adenovirus one and foul adenovirus B species contains five, serotype five, C species contains serotype 4 and 10. And the D, D uh, species contains serotype 2, serotype 3, serotype 9, and 11. And the final one, species E, phylum species E, contains phylum 6, 7, 8, A, and 8, P. So altogether, there are 12 serotypes we need to address. So in Sri Lankan contest, many suspected cases are reported in broiler farming. Recently confirmed cases was published by our veterinary research institute DAPH based on the histopathical findings. And FAD vaccine was introduced under user permit to the broiler parents, which is a very good move. The vaccine covers foul adenovirus serotype 4. And we need to serotype the, do the serotyping in the foul adenovirus infection in the Sri Lanka in order to have proper and sustainable intervention. So currently we are in the process of serotyping and we found actually more than one serotype in the country and we in recent past, in the future, we will uh, publish the results. Okay, now let's look at, those are the main burns coming from these four diseases. So now let's look at as veterinarians, how we use vaccines properly to mitigate the risk and stop these kind of uh, outbreaks. So first we have to think about when you select the vaccine, it's more similar vaccine is to, to the natural disease. So the better the immune response to the vaccine and better the protection offered. So no vaccine in the world give 100% protection to the disease. So even in the US, most of the vaccines, licensed vaccines, they achieve seven to 90% effective. So, when we, come, when we talk about vaccines, we always, we are in our mind, the antibodies are coming into our mind. Other than the antibody, 
that is adaptive immune response, we have to focus or the, remember the innate immunity play a bigger role in the host immune mechanism, especially with the viruses. Associated with the cytokine and the chemokines, TNF alpha, interleukin 12, in, interferon alpha and interferon gamma, and the function of the natural killer cells and the T cells. So once you introduce the vaccine, the, it takes some time. It takes some time to trigger the response to the antibody or the humoral immunity, or sometimes it can be it can trigger the cell immune immunity. So this part is very important to block the entry of the virus, entry of the virus. So promote the local immunity. Promoting the local immunity is very important. If the vaccine is following the route of natural infection, that will actually promote the local immunity, local immunity or the mucosal immunity associated with the uh, vaccine response. So ideal vaccine to produce the same immune protection, which usually follows natural infection, but without causing disease. This is our, our expectation. And we also, we expect as when you administer the vaccine, it should give you the long lasting immunity with a few, with two doses or more than two doses. And it should interrupt the spread of the infection. Third point is very important because we can, by administering the vaccine, we can stop the clinical disease. But if they are infected, they might not show the clinical symptoms, but they, the, they actually, the virus will utilize their cells in the host, host and in the host, and they will propagate and they won't cause the clinical symptoms or the infection, but that will be propagated and spreaded throughout the environment. So whether this vaccine is going to interrupt the spreading of the infection in order to control the disease. So the vaccine manufacturers actually, they, they look at three angles when they produce vaccine. The first, they look at the disease immunity, the prevent clinical disease and mortality. So that is the first intention how you stop the clinical symptoms and how you stop the mortality. That is a common practice. Then they should evaluate the vaccine, whether it is providing the blocking immunity, stop shedding of the pathogens, which stop transmission of disease to susceptible animals. So that means this vaccine should be able to prevent the disease, plus it will stop shedding of the pathogen and spreading the virus particle to the environment. Finally, so far nobody has, or no one, no vaccine company has, company has developed this type of vaccine, sterilizing immunity. Prevent infection by preventing pathogen attaching to the target cell, but rarely achieved, rarely achieved. So if the virus can't attach, if the virus can't attach, that means virus can't infect the live cell, the host. So if the vaccines achieve the sterilizing immunity level, that's the best way of uh, best vaccine that is available to vaccinate. But at the moment, we look at the disease immunity and blocking immunity in a, as a practical approach. So this can be actually uh, studied. So once we vaccinate the flock, once we vaccinate the flock, so for, for example, if we take the very, very well Newcastle disease virus, strain you can challenge that flock with the, with the effective dose, right? Effective dose of uh, LED50. Uh, uh, then you can see the protection. Protection. Then that after challenging from the very virulent Newcastle virus, you can introduce the sentinel birds, means that they are birds the same age, but they are not vaccinated against this disease. Then see whether these birds, the unvaccinated birds, are they are going to get the disease, or are they going to say, show the symptoms? That means these vaccinated flock, if they are having the symptoms and if they have the mortality, so with this vaccinated flocks might not show in the clinical so symptoms. That means they have the clinical immunity, but they don't have this blocking immunity. That means they, the virus go in, they propagate, and it will be spreading. They will be spreading to the cloaca and oral, oral pharynx, and this viral particle then captured by the unvaccinated birds and they get the disease. That means this flock has been vaccinated, but they have the clinical immunity, but they don't have the blocking immunity. So 
this is also a very important thing that we have to achieve uh, in the in the field and practical way. There's a practical way to stop spreading the diseases. Diseases, because otherwise we will keep on having the disease in the endemic level. So when it comes to the uh, ND vaccines, the, the, the disease is transmitted through oropharyngeal route. So evaluation of the virus in vaccinated flocks is very important during the challenge with current circulating pathogenic NDV because this tells that the changes in the virus, changes in the um, administration of the virus vaccine, so that can have uh, effect on the host response. So if we are not achieved to a certain uh, antibody titers, a certain level of expectation uh, in the host immune uh, response, the teeters, antibody teeters. So the there won't be any clinical immunity, but there can be, they can act as the spreader, right? Spreaders to the disease. So this has been very thoroughly studied, the homologous use of homologous vaccine, genotype vac uh, match vaccines and unmatched vaccines, what is going to happen, but we have to add, uh, remember the Newcastle disease virus is belongs to the genotype uh, 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 vaccine, belongs to genotype two, and it's below the same serotype. So depending on the tropism also, some, some viruses. Okay, so also changes in the tropism of the virus, changes in the tropism of the virus, we have to understand as veterinarians, so uh, initially it, it effect, infect to the one organ, one tissue, then it will deviate to the another organ. So this is very important to understand the tropism. So the, when we select the vaccine, we have to select the best vaccine that can trigger the, low, the immunity in both systems. So the virus tropism and the infectivity, we have to take in to make, we have to uh, consider both. So very recently, most of the vaccine producers, they went with uh, recombinant vaccines technology and they produced the uh, attenuated genotype 7 vaccines. Also, they also think about the uh, VGGA, some kind of I mean, different vaccine strains that can tr trigger the both uh, infection, uh, sorry, trigger the immune response in uh, lungs and also in the GIT. That means by administering these kind of uh, vaccines, it will trigger the same level of immunity in both systems. So whether the field strain is a pneumotrophic or the viscerotrophic, it doesn't matter because the vaccine will induce the same kind of a similar vaccine induced immunity in the both systems. So now most of the recently uh, introduced recombinant ND multivalent vaccines used in the hatcheries were considered this disease burden, especially with the variations in the Newcastle disease, uh, you know, type two and the seven day, and they, they put this vaccine and then produce the vaccine in a certain way that it can actually work uh, Act, act against this uh, extra burden coming from genotype 7 in the infections. Okay, now let's know how we can handle this IB, infectious bronchitis. We, we already discussed that IB, we have uh, classical strains and also the variant type of strains. So once we realize our country is present with this variant and the classical strains, then we have to go with the vaccine vaccination program that use the prototype uh, protection. Prototype studies reveal that if you have a combined vaccines with the classical strain and the uh, variant strain in your uh, vaccination program of poultry, that will induce the protection, that will induce the protection against heterologous field strains. So that means not, not uh, there are different type of variations in the IV uh, viruses. So both can be captured if you use this kind of uh, protector type uh, uh, vaccination programs uh, in the field. So I will repeat it again. If we are going to vaccinate the IV, that then we have to think about the presence of the field uh, strains and their characterization. When it comes to Sri Lanka, we have already observed that the 793B group and the uh, mass type classical strains are present. So then what we have to do is, in our vaccine program, we should have both vaccines belong to those two clusters. And, uh, uh, and, uh, Sir, I think slides are not moving. And, 
very important uh, in, in, incorporating to the uh, dr dilan yes dr dilan yes uh, your slides are not moving please uh, see what's ah, right. wrong no now is in the uh, you can see the pay, uh, solution selection of vaccines right no still uh, the slide is on innate and adaptive immunity ah is that so i will reshare it so can you can you see my screen again yeah now it is a solution uh, so what was the last slide vaccines what was the last slide so shall i shall i uh, start from here Yeah. Then can you can you go so back three right, slides? Yeah. Solution then. selection of vaccines. Yeah. Ah, uh, we didn't see this one. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, uh, in a, did you see this screen? This one? No. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. This is immunity blocking immunity sterilizing immunity. Uh, now, now it is on aims of vaccination. Back, back, back. Okay. Okay. So the ideal vaccines. I will just uh, rush through the uh, presentation again. So the ideal vaccine we expect the immune protection which usually follows natural infection, but without causing the disease. and uh, uh then uh, we should expect to have low lasting immunity and interrupt spread of the infection but however uh, when it comes to vaccination there are three main aims that we desire one first one is disease immunity prevent clinical disease and mortality and that is what we initially gain but the vaccine should also create the blocking immunity stop shedding of pathogens which stop transmission of disease to susceptible animals so rather than uh, stop the clinical disease and the mortality vaccine induced immunity should stop the replication of the virus inside the body and shedding of the virus to the environment so that need to be evaluated and finally it's very difficult to achieve sterilizing immunity when once you are vaccinated once we have given the vaccine so the virus can't enter to the body so they have the local and the mucosal immunity so virus can't even attach to the receptor it is very rarely achieved so so vaccine manufacturers they are clearly working on these three aspect but initially we achieve only for, for the first line of defense which is the disease immunity then try to achieve more uh, uh, reliable with the reliable facts we try to achieve the blocking immunity so how you evaluate this blocking immunity so we can use the vaccinated flock and challenge uh, with the very virulent newcastle disease virus and the same time we can introduce unvaccinated uh, same age chicken to this flock and see what is going to happen with this unvaccinated chicken so if they are getting the infection and Uh, clinical symptoms if they can we can see the infection and clinical symptoms that means this vaccinated flock are clinically normal but they spread the disease so this spread the virus right they spread the virus then they these unvaccinated birds they will get the dose and expose and they can develop the symptom that means this vaccinated flock they only show the clinical immunity but they have this uh they they act as the reservoirs or the carriers to propagate the virus so if we can develop a vaccine up to the blocking stage or the t test up to a blocking uh, level then we can actually uh stop the spread of the disease and also we can think about uh, uh removing the that particular disease from the country and then uh, you know having this kind of, disease as a endemic endemic disease so for example nd the, uh, there are many uh, vaccines developed but 
the best thing what we have, can do is we have to follow the natural route of infection natural route of infection given in via given the vaccine so we we talk about this genotypes 2 and genotype 7 and both uh, actually both uh, genotypes are belongs one serotype of newcastle disease virus avian paramyxo virus serotype 1 so i people actually argue the scientists there are two groups actually argue even though it is genotype 2 or 7 this is one serotype that this genotype 2 vaccine should be able to able to uh, protect the uh, genotype 7 infection and also Uh, the virus keep on change in the tropism uh, the affinity towards certain different uh, different organs or tissues so initially like ib they start from the respiratory tract and end up with other different uh, tissues uh, also the nd certain uh, field strains they actually uh, have the affinity for both git and the respiratory tract so pneumotrophic and the viscerotrophic so scientists they have done a lot of studies on this Genotype two and seven viruses, and they identify the tropism. And later on, uh, they incorporate these uh, uh, changes or the in the field viruses and the disease burden uh, into the newly developed uh, multivalent recombinant vaccines used in hatcheries. And most of them are actually used to genotype seven antigenic fusion protein to incorporate in the in the in the vaccine to have more protection against field vaccines. let's take this uh, influenza bronchitis case there we have to have a protector type uh, uh, approach to uh, protect birds that means the researchers showed that if you are very really sure about having the variant type of influenza bronchitis virus in the field and if i only use in the classical type of vaccine in the field there will be a partial protection so the heterologous uh, vax uh, field challenges coming from the field then you should have more homologous type of uh, uh, immunity towards those uh, different various in the challenges so having a classical strain in the virus classical vaccine strain in the vaccine program together with the priming or the boosting together with the variant strain right can have more protection in the in the field in the field uh, with the chicken especially when you have high uh, ib uh, v burden in the areas in the areas so it is recommended to have a combination of uh, classical and the variant vaccine strains in the vaccination program this kind of strategies can minimize the uh, ib problem in the field and not only the vaccine this is also very important uh, root of uh, vaccination so we know that we do the mass vaccination for uh, poultry because we are not dealing with one one bird we are dealing with more than 500 maybe 1 million birds sometime so the the time taken for the vaccination is very very important so basically in the mass vaccination we we adhere three different uh, routes the drinking water and uh, spray or the aerosols and intraocular methods so this is one of the uh, experiment done in done to uh, evaluate the different routes of vaccination and their efficacy so the, the there are studies telling that if you use the drinking water or sometimes the aerosol uh, you can induce only the 50 to 60% of the crop community so the rest of the 40 flocks will not get the enough immune uh, uh, dose of the vaccine therefore we, they won't develop the enough level of host immune response induced by the vaccine so this has been evaluated and what they have done is they have vaccinated the flock against nd and challenged challenge uh, with the virulent uh, newcastle disease virus so the different colors the different colors shows the different uh, vaccination routes the first one is the aerosol the ash color and the uh, the red one is the intracular route and the drinking water is the green color and the line level control no vaccination no vaccination for that flock so you can see when you uh, challenge with the very virulent newcastle disease virus at day 2 almost all the birds 100% died because that means at day 2 following vaccination they had don't have the protection when they challenge with day 3 and almost all the birds died except the aerosol root group only 30 30% died from the 
from the uh, spray of the aerosol route. So at day four, so zero died from the aerosol group and 30 uh, percent birds died from the intraocular route, intraocular route. So this shows that in aerosol and the intraocular route is more prominent and more efficient in triggering the uh, immunity. Why it is aerosol is more prominent than the intraocular? Intraocular covers nine to 95% of the birds, but the aerosol actually go through the natural infection. So they build no, more robust uh, local immunity the immune, the mucous surface. So virus will have problem, viruses will have problem in attaching the, at the local, local uh, site. So intraocular, the, when you put the, trigger the hard area in the gland, takes a little bit time to trigger the immune response. But from the drinking water, you can say at day seven or so, the severe model like 70% observed. So this shows us the efficacy of different uh, routes adhering to the vaccination in mass scale vaccination. And in addition to that uh, study, uh, another study actually assess the uh, antibody response the, through the HI theta after ND vaccination. So hemoglobin inhibition theta, they have measured and you can see the red color is the aerosol, the pink color is the, sorry, aerosol is the uh, pink color and the red color is the uh, intraocular, the blue, sorry, green is the drinking water. So you can see the HI theta's are actually almost high, very, uh, almost at the first aerosol triggered the highest HI theta and secondly, the intraocular. So you can see higher the HI theta, you have better chance of neutralizing the field infection. So what is our objective of vaccination? We have to achieve higher antibody theters or else indirectly we can say higher HI theters. So it has been materialized with the aerosol and intraocular. So when it comes to intraocular, handling chick one by or chicken one by is very difficult. So you can see the aerosol is the best or the spray method is the best method to replace uh, the vaccination, especially is the ND and IB uh, in, in, the, in the areas where you have high disease burden. And I'm going to a little bit change this topic into the host side now. So we know that even influenza, infectious bronchitis, nuclear disease virus. So we should admit that all these viruses use only one receptor in the cell to attach. That is sialic acid receptor. Sialic acid receptor. So when we vaccinate, right? So the sialic acid receptors present in the cell walls, cell membranes are limited. So when you vaccinate and those vaccines, right, contains this respiratory viruses, right? And if you vaccinate them in a very shorter period, right, shorter period without having much time gaps, that means definitely it will affect to the uh, efficacy of the vaccine, efficacy of the vaccine. Therefore, we have to think uh, about uh, combine the vaccine this aspect as well. The receptor that is going to uh, challenge with your vaccine. So differ, most of the respiratory device like IBV and NDV, they actually share the same receptor to enter to the cell. So now let's take the chicken anemia virus infection in broilers and layers. So first is the best thing that we can control the disease is the biosecurity hygiene of the farm. And the good vaccination program to be implemented at the parent level, at the parent level, in order to carry out or the, in order to have the proper an antibody or the protection against the uh, subsequent infection, as well as passing the protective level of maternal derived antibodies to the offspring, the day old chicks. So when they have protective level of antibodies, what will happen is at the initial phase, even the farm is infected, if they have protective level of antibodies, they will not get the disease at the first three weeks. So this is very important to have a good vaccination program with two live vaccines or the two uh, live with, uh, combined with kill in the breeder farms, either breeder or the layer, to have this kind uh, to have enough protection in the in the uh, parent level as well as in the chick level in commercial broiler and layer operation and the serological monitoring program the ELISA to assess efficacy of the vaccination program. So 
not only in the parents, we can take the serology, uh, the picture of the CAV from the day all six and see whether they have enough level of maternal antibodies to protect uh, during this first two, three weeks against the CAV. And also, if, we, if our parents are having the enough level of uh, antibodies against the infection of CAV, they won't get the infection and transmit the disease horizontally and also vertically. So at the top level, if we are having the proper management and the proper mechanism to control the CAV, this disease will not come to the commercial lay and royal operation. Though in Sri Lanka, we practice sometimes the commercial layers, we, we, we introduce CAV vaccines, but thing is we have to assess whether it is commercially viable as well as are we having a proper control of CAV at the parent level. So if we touch that position, definitely we can reduce the CAV burden in the country. The basic rules in setting up a vaccine program, I am highlighting though we are equipped with very high tech rocket science, diagnostics and everything, back to basics. Interspacing between live respiratory vaccines, breeders and commercial layers, at least 14 days because of this common receptor shared by them, and the broilers, at least 10 days. Encourage combined actions, but not, the, not three injections, but try to combine the vaccines manufactured by the same manufacturer because they are really uh, done the research on the dose uh, that are going in the vaccine, in between the vaccination and the uh, evenness of the dose and the uh, competition that can happen or any interaction that can happen in the host. So the same manufacturer combination recommended. So, and also that will reduce the handling. So in case of uh, herpes virus, turkey herpes virus, as a vector for recombinant vaccine, use maximum of one HVT recombinant vaccine. Also, in, in the case of classic HVT, in case uh, the HVT recombinant is used on the same time. That means, for example, so if you are vaccinating against Marex, Marex is a herpes virus, turkey herpes virus. So Marex is the first disease that we should uh, think about if it is com commercial layer and the parents because it caused many problem in the farm if you have if you got the marriage. So it's in a new suppressive disease. So if you are targeting to apply two vaccines at day zero for the commercial layers or the parents, first you go you have to go up first with the classical Marex vaccine, it's GT plus respirator, no, whatever the combination, you have to think about producing the protection against Marex disease. Then there are new vaccines produced. This HD as the vector, herpes vector. They have put other antigenic protein of Newcastle disease, IB, right, IBD, right? Those antigenic proteins, and they recommend at the day zero. But for the parents and the commercial layers, if you are going to vaccinate by using, uh, if you are going to vaccinate the Marex against the Marex, plus you are going to use these vaccines, Right now, the, the international veterinarian that they demote this practice at the same day. So first day you go with the Marex, then you have to have a gap, right? And uh, or else you had to use other conventional type of vaccines, conventional type of vaccines when in the field or the farm uh, to vaccinate against other diseases. So don't combine normal HVT vaccine with the recombinant HVT vaccines, and also the Foul pox, uh, any recombinant vaccine made out from foul pox, the pox virus, right? If you are trying to administer that vaccine, do not use a classical foul pox before, before the this recombinant foul pox vaccines. Then what will happen is if, if you want to use the recombinant foul pox vaccines, first you use the classical foul pox and vaccinate your flock against the pox, foul pox, then you can think about the uh, recombinant vaccine uh, made out from foul pox. So, but it's recommended to have a maximum of one foul pox recombinant in the vaccination program. If we have a transfer ARM facility, right? We, we have a grow farm and the layer farm separately. In order to avoid the unnecessary stress and the mortality, we should avoid the vaccines 
uh, two weeks before the transfer in the grower farm. Keep at least four weeks time gap between live and kill homolog vaccines, as well as at least four weeks in between the same kill vaccines. So not only the vaccination and vaccine procedure, the monitoring of the vaccine efficacy is very, very important current days. We can do it by two ways. First one is the quantitative value, where you can quantify the antibodies or the uh, produced in the uh, bo uh, body as the response. And also you can see the vaccination site, see whether the vaccination reaction is present, especially in the foul pox. So how you can do this quantitative value? So currently we do through the ELISA, <coughs> immunosorbent link, enzymatic immunosorbent assay. Also in early days, we use the HIV test, hemoglobin inhibition for ND. It's a quite old slide, old slide published by Food and Agriculture in 1978, but it's still worth for us to look at it. So you can see with the Newcastle disease, uh, if your HI teeters are under two to power four, log two, four, you can prevent the death of the animal, right? But still there will be a production loss. Then if it's two to power eight, right? Then you can stop the production losses, the production losses. So in 1978, here they have emphasized to maintain the proper uh, immunity or the antibody teeters in the flocks. It's irrespective of the commercial or the backyard. So if we can maintain these titers in the, in the chicken or the poultry, up to this extent, we can release the endemic status of the country. Actually, we can fight against the Newcastle disease virus. And nowadays we use ELISA uh, to uh, quantify the vaccine response. So basically, we, we, we conduct this test to the, from the blood sample serum. So we have to collect around 2 to 3 ml of blood. So this will uh, give 0 0.5 to 0 0.75 ml of serum. We can collect to the disposable of the syringe and uh, put into the uncoated glass and send to the lab as soon as possible in uh, 4 to 8 centigrade. If we are going to not, not going to evaluate it, if we're going to long-term storage, we have to store in the minus 20, but it's recommended to do the take the blood and send the samples as soon as possible to the lab for uh, testing. And when we do ELISA, we always try to get the representative samples. And all the birds in the flock should have the same possibility to get the will be selected to get the blood. And also if it's a very large or the medium scale operations, it is recommended to take at least 23 birds, at least in random basis and do the bleeding and send the sample. Otherwise, this efficacy testing will not be representative. And normally in ELISA, we calculate the specific uh, antibodies against the vaccine used or the disease used, sorry, virus, uh, used in the vaccine. And uh, we calculate the mean average theta levels and the variation of the theta levels. So variation of the theta levels represent by the coefficient of the variation as a percentage. So if we have vaccinated the flock and the vaccine has been uh, absorbed or the given to very evenly to the entire flock, our variance should be lower. That means the coefficient of variance should be lower. So that's another index we call vaccination index. That is mean theta divided by the percentage of the CV. Higher the mean theta, lower the CV, you will get the high vaccination index. So in certain vaccination programs, you might get high vaccination index. Also, sometime when during the infection, you will have the high vaccination index that they depend on, depends on the vaccination program. So having a high vaccination index without the infection, High mean teeters, low CV also well, it all is, is the desire of the veterinarian after vaccinating. And if it's the CV is less than 40, we evaluate the vaccination procedures in the farm and also the 
antibody treaters of the flock that can prevent the possible infection. So this is uh, the same flock that we have evaluated at 24 weeks, 42 weeks, and uh, 58 weeks against infectious bursal disease. You can see at this 24 weeks, just after the two kill and the live vaccines, it's very narrow and most of the birds having high theta levels. And with the time, so no vaccines has been used in, have been used in the production period, only the growing period. So with the time, you can see that this histogram get more wider and wider because the theta levels will go down with the age and with the, in their 58 weeks, still you can see the uh, CV is 26. So this is uh, a good example for good, good vaccination program conducted in the farm. Also, the, how they have administered, how they have administered. So if you can achieve this, and if you monitor the vaccine efficacy throughout the age at the critical period, then we can have a good idea about the uh, resistance from the host again, this IBD, as well as the mental antibody treaters that is going to pass from the uh, parents to the uh, day old chicks. So, taking efficacy using ELISA for newly developed recommended vaccines, please remember from the service provider ELISA, we have to cross-check whether the recombinant vaccines has, if we are going to use against uh, certain diseases. We have to check with the service provider these, whether these recombinant vaccines can be traced by the ELISA because with this new approach, the, there are certain ELISA testing commercial kits that are not supporting, some kits are supporting, so we have to check with the supply. So otherwise, after vaccination, when you do the serology, you won't see the proper antibody treaters. It might be because of the wrong uh, uh, commercial play, place that we have applied. Other than the ELISA, another technique that we use is the PCR nowadays. And this is not to evaluate the serology of the uh, diseases, but to uh, early detection of the disease, the deadly diseases. So now uh, most of the vaccine companies, they, they are going through the biotechnology. The, they are taking the advances in biotechnology and they try to uh, develop the vaccines with the fluorescence. Then you can uh, the, uh, see the antibodies uh, produced and the vaccine present in the first uh, cell. And also it will help us to differentiate the field strains and the vaccine strains inside the body. So if we are actually in a, in a, in a large scale or medium scale operation, uh, and then especially in the parent level, and also in the commercial lay operation, in the boil operation, sometimes if we are having some risk of getting the diseases or early detection, uh, we can use the PCR technology to detect the diseases. So right at the moment, uh, our faculty and also some uh, private diagnostic lab, they, they provide this service to uh, diagnose diseases, uh, especially the main viral diseases, the bacterial diseases through this QRT-PCR technology. And other than this uh, serological testing, the most easiest uh, way of checking the vaccine efficacy to see the vaccination reactions, again, especially in the pox. Vaccination, 10 days after vaccination, the minimum you have, you can randomly select 100 birds and see the vaccine reaction is present or not. That tells you how, whether the pen keeper, the vaccinator has done the proper job. If we are using a water vaccination, we can use the dyes to see the uh, coverage. And also this is the same thing, you can use the dyes to see the coverage. So, so this is my last slide. And the summary take home message, the successful disease prevention always rely on effective biosecurity pro program. So this is number one. So we should not compromise biosecurity at any stage of the farming, the designing process, selecting process, the lo location. So the conceptual level, structural level, and the operational, all three steps are important. The vaccine-induced protection always rely on burden of the disease, type of the vaccine used, vaccination program, nutritional status of the bird, and the correct vaccine administration. The third one, Vaccine admission is best audited on site at point of application. So we, as veterinarians, always look at how they are going to administer, how they are going to maintain the call chain, and are they are doing a proper job. So it's very important. 
check correct procedures using tools to evaluate uniformity of the administration. Like uh, ELISA, you can check all the visual observation. The retrospectively, the success of the vaccine admission can be evaluated in terms of the serological results. But it might be late sometime if you are not in inspecting at the site. Attention to the details of the administration is required to achieve a consistent immune response following vaccination. So this is very important for us. Otherwise, we blame for the vaccine producer and also the uh, type of vaccines used and everything. So first, we have to look at the efficacy of our vaccine program. That is the best tool we can check the uh, immunity level of the host in the birds and the type of the health uh, level that uh, you are going to pass or the antibody levels that you're going to pass in next progeny. So thank you so much. Hope you have seen my last slide. Yes, Dr. Dilan. Thank you very much. Uh, all, almost uh, within one and a half hours, you finish, and it was a wonderful uh, presentation, and uh, it was very interesting and informative. And uh, hope uh, our participants have a lot of questions to ask and uh, make clarify or clarifications if they want anything uh, regarding the, your presentation. And it's now time for the participants to ask questions. You may type your questions in chat box or you may uh, switch on your mic uh, and ask the question directly from Dr. Dilan. Uh, so now floor is for, open for discussion. So anybody having questions? At the moment, we don't have questions in the chat box and uh, we'd like to get more questions and get clarified from Dr. Dilan. So please sum up. Dr. Dilan, I'm uh, Dr. Buddhika from CIC Pet Care. Uh, yeah, Dr. Buddhika, yes. I have a small question. Uh, it was a nice uh, and comprehensive presentation, and I should thank for that. And uh, one, my question is, uh, uh, you have described about uh, the NCD. Uh, when you have, when birds have NCD, there may be some mm -hmm. cytokine cytokine storm. So yeah. due, to, due to NCD, so what kind of uh, damage or the lesions can be seen grossly in lungs or duodenum to, to differentiate from other, other infections? Uh, you have described it uh, in a histopathologically, but uh, just wanted to know what, whether there's any different uh, gross lesions appear in the bird's carcasses uh, due to cytokine stones. Actually, most of the time you can see the hemorrhages in the diodidum and the proventriculus. Uh, uh, those are very common in genotype 7 infection. Uh, yeah. But the thing is with the vaccines that we are, we are using, because most of the time the commercial birds now, they have vaccine-induced immunity to a level, certain level, not to the up to the... Uh, expected level or, you know, uh, to stop the clinical disease. So we also observed that uh, sometime even after vaccination program, where, whether it's genotype 7 infection or any kind of other velogenic infection, we won't expect uh, uh, huge mortality uh, 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 in the like 7 to 80 percent. So this is uh, actually the parcel protection uh, that you are having from the vaccination program. Therefore, and in the gross lesions, we will, we will not see the very typical kind of uh, lesions that we expect uh, or that we have read from the books. Yeah. But uh, when it comes to histology and, you know, this type of molecular uh, uh, differentiation, you see the uh, action coming from this uh, cytokines and everything. And we have to admit that that histology and the cytokines I have shown you, those are from the SPF chicken, exper experimentally in introduced. Yeah. yeah. So the actual picture and those pictures can be varied. Yes. So I uh, just wanted to know whether there is any cytokine storm uh, triggering by the vaccine strains as well. No, no. Oh. Vaccine strains will not yeah. trigger. This is about field strains, genotype 7 field strains. 
Yes. Okay. Because vaccine strains will not enter to the cell. That's why we categorize them as uh, lentogenic. Right. Okay. So, uh, in a, so thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? No, no, no. Okay, Dr. Milan, uh, we're getting a few questions uh, through the chat box. Uh, you may also read it. And uh, one okay. question is uh, not regarding vaccination. Uh, Dr. Nagain is asking about deworming schedule. Yeah. It's a... Yeah, yeah. Deworming schedule actually. In... Yeah, it's something that it's, it's very common in the poultry and it's really available in the. The drugs are really available. So what, the only point is, uh, we in commercial poultry, it depends on the bird. Like if they are actually in the close uh, environment and well managed, uh, we recommend to have every other month. And then when if they are in production, uh, we uh, demote giving the levomisole. That's because it can it can cause production losses. But albendazole and everything we can apply on those uh, production period. Uh, however. Uh, in the backyard poultry, it depends on the burden of the burden coming from the environment. So it depends that whether to use if they are in production, and not the lamb so other type of uh, deworming uh, drugs. Uh, I think every uh, for that backyard definitely every month you have to follow uh, if they are exposed to house, outside environment. Okay, another question: How the coefficient of variation is calculated? Okay. The coefficient of variation calculated, actually, when we uh, assume that we have taken the back from 30 birds, then we have the mean theta, that is the average value of the all 30 birds, as well as you get the uh, lowest level and also highest level. So, so that is the range. Then uh, in, in our statistics, there is a way that we calculate the standard deviation. Standard deviation means from the mean, how much it has been varied. So standard deviation is high mean, you have huge variation. And standard deviation is low means you have narrow variation. So square root of the standard deviation considered as the coefficient of variation. That means if you have a higher SD, you will have higher CV. If you have a lower SD, you have a lower coefficient. So this is how the coefficient of variation calculated. What is the importance of giving CA vaccine to commercial layers? Yes, very good question. <clears throat> Some farmers are practicing actually. That's why I high highlighted. But this commercial vaccine is actually available. There are three types of vaccines available in the country. And uh, uh, I do not personally recommend to give commercial vaccine to commercial broilers. Well, broilers, of course, is not necessary layers. And uh, because if we have a proper vaccination program in commercial, sorry, breeders, parent or breeders at the parent level, either broiler or layer, we can stop the disease burden for the commercial layers and the broilers. So no need to give a commercial layer vaccine because the commercial layers, they are all chicks. If they are not having the correct effective uh, titers against CAV, they might have the diseases. And the price of the commercial layer is quite expensive. Because of that, in order to reduce this loss, some farmers, they are, go, they are going and vaccinate commercial layers. And the commercial vaccine also expensive. So for the sustainable approach, we have to uh, pay the attention at the parent level. So uh, starting age of deworming and chicks, with, or normally if you're referring to the back cat, uh, I don't have much experience, but in the commercial uh, environment, we start around two to three months. After three months only we start. Yeah, the Dr. Gamla has asked the, in case of IBH infection, what are your recommendations embryo and economic loss? What we have to do is as soon as possible, we have to identify the serotypes involved in this infection, the pathological lesions, the serotypes causing the pathological lesions in the, in the production, I mean the broiler industry. 
then either we have to ex best way is going for the vaccine but most of the countries including thailand they went for the local vaccine because why they want to produce the homologous vaccines uh, to the field strains uh, that are already causing the disease in the field so matching the serotype and evaluating the cross potential only uh, is the way forward otherwise this will continue in future and we will have a lot of uh, economical losses to the uh, industry dr nilan hi uh, yeah. yeah thank you for your presentation i have a question can you hear me yeah i can hear you dr nilan yeah uh, dr me this is a bit of uh, deviated uh, part what about the pet birds say love birds and all i'm actually a um, animal quarantine officer so at times uh, mm. uh, when we need to export you know we need to uh, do some uh, new cause of vaccine uh, to the you know pet birds we have to according to the country requirements uh, what about any idea about the uh, oral vaccine uh, effect of oral vaccine anything on pet birds have been done doctor yeah actually i don't have a uh, research experience in on the pet birds but uh, the thing is most uh, challenging uh, uh, work will be how you can give if or if you can give it uh, eye drop as eye drop it will be better it is available because it's easy to administer and more you know effective wise more prominent but uh, the thing is uh, as a, you you can't go for the oral because there are not uh, you know it's either these vaccines are like 1000 or 500 minimum 1000 sometime now 1000 doses in one while so uh, you have to find a manufacturer who's catering to this uh, uh, market as well and also one option is going for this uh, uh, ocular vaccination that of course doctor would be giving a much stress to the pet birds because they are not you know hardy as uh, poultry uh, so but yeah. uh, but they you know they can get it uh, you know um, divided losses when uh, in, in the government from through the government with the surgeons no but what i but my question is whether any studies have been done on uh, uh, effect of pet birds or anything uh, like that Or the no, I, I, so far, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I was not seen for the effect okay. of it, but there are more than 259 bird species affected from NDV. It has been reported. Ah, pet birds. Pet birds, including pet birds. Okay, where doctor is in overall the world? Overall, overall, and they have evaluated in more than uh, because it, the, the, depending on the literature, it is more than 259 species affected by avian species affected by the NDV. Okay, then um, vaccination will do some protection. No? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We promote the vaccination. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, doctor. And other another question you you have mentioned uh, when we when we give the oral vaccine, uh, you know, by coloring the vaccine, we can we could see the tongue. But uh, you didn't mention after how many days, uh, you know, it. The first thing you said, uh, you have given after ten days, we need to check the. you know flux in a sample uh, that is soon sample. after the vaccination as soon after the vaccination okay. we can see the colorings of the tongue or the in feathers after and in, in the dye soon after the vaccination feathers you know feathers also that when we give yeah, the yeah if vaccine. you use the spray spray vaccination it will appear on the feathers okay and the neck okay doctor and that, uh, if uh, if we use the colored vaccine oral vaccine would it be lasting for 2 uh, 3 days till oh, no 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 only what the one it, there won't be any effect to the you know time for the vaccine okay. we, we have as soon as possible we have to vaccinate because the manufacturers recommend certain uh, time like 2 to 3 maximum 2 hours so based on that uh, the, this adding color will not extend the uh, viability of the vaccine Doctor Vishnu, yes. Uh, are there any questions from the participants? Dilan, can I raise a, a one layman question? Uh, sure, Dilan, yeah, Doctor Dilan. Yeah. yeah, I mean uh, the, the a flock uh, with uh, subclinical, you know, disease condition for any 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 kind of these viral diseases that you mentioned, list of diseases. Do you mm -hmm. advise? I mean, uh, 
do you advise to vaccinate them or oh, i mean uh, after giving vaccines uh, will the will the clinical signs appear and get the things worst or oh, i mean uh, it is it will be uh, having uh, i mean more protection for the birds okay very good question uh, mr president randika not the layman question is actually we yeah. recommend only the vaccination for healthy birds right that's the recommendation so okay. we don't when they are at the subclinical level and the first slide i show you that they can it can be they, are, they can be in the incubation period so they are already yes. they have exposed but uh, yeah, the birds are, are not showing the symptoms right so yes. so that we cannot uh, skip because we don't see any clinical signs but by adding even the vaccine definitely it will affect the efficacy so and also sometimes there are incidences uh, when they are infected and during the incubation if we have given the vaccine uh it might uh, increase the risk of uh, problem and the severity as well but uh, we normal in a commercial environment uh, if mm -hmm. what fog is affected what we are doing is uh, as soon as possible we introduce the uh, vaccine to the, uh, revaccinate the other flocks surrounding to the affected flock that is recommended as soon mm -hmm. as possible now ah, okay and and isolating the Uh, affected uh, flock uh, and uh, with the maximum biosecurity measures yeah thank you very much dilan yeah there are the questions uh, at the main time dr dilan we see yes. uh, we see uh, that uh, uh, stick still we see that uh, from the provincial level there is a promotion of that uh, small scale Uh, backyard poultry uh, by distributing a uh, small number of uh, animals birds i mean 20 50 100 uh, like that and uh, they are that uh, one month chick program that uh, some certain people get the contract of producing this one month chicks so they buy chicks commercial chicks from uh, uh, hatcheries and they uh, uh, raise up to about one month and uh, distribute to this uh, veterinary officers and there they uh, do a vaccination uh, of a kind of a short schedule it is incomplete as far as i see uh, because within one month they complete uh, they do few several uh, vaccines for such as uh, rx ibd ib md uh, so on so only few vaccines are given and uh, the vaccination course is not uh, completed and within one month even the fox vaccine is given and uh, distributed so this kind of vaccination schedule which is incomplete uh, probably it will not be effective and at the same time will it have a, an impact on the uh, disease in the field what do you think yeah um, uh, this is a good question actually uh, uh, this this activity is going on in sri lanka because uh, it is one way of uh, Uh, you know, uh, increase the availability of quality property to the poor, you know, uh, villages and the rural area. Yes. So that is the main aim. So, but the thing is, uh, these birds, if they are not vaccinated, especially this, uh, you know, against certain endemic diseases, these these birds get the disease, and also uh, they will act as the reservoirs and uh, and also carriers, and uh, there might be a problem yes. to the commercial and uh, industry. Uh, and also it, we want achieve to the targets uh, of those projects and intentions that we actually distribute uh, chicks to the backyard so this pro this program should go ahead with the proper uh, vaccination program and the education and awareness program to the uh, farmers and backyard farmers and the villages and also we should have a stringent program to vaccinate against those flocks at the right time with the right dose to uh, in the in the field to maintain the uh, effective level of antibodies against certain you know endemic viral diseases in the country especially new class of disease so otherwise if it is like having you know uh, spreading the disease uh, back to the commercial environment and commercial to the back to the backyard so the both the production system will be affected yes thank you very much dilana I see another question through chat box. Uh, in case of vaccination against IBH, in which level we should address it properly? At the level or commercial level? Uh, 
Yeah, in case of vaccination Did against IBS, in which level we should address it properly? Actual level or commercial? It's at the parent level. It's at the parent level we have to address. Parent level, parent broiler yes, and the two yes. and the yeah. Dr. Dilom, are you clear? If you want no. to. At what, what age, doctor, you are recommending the parent level? Uh, it depends. Uh, not only it depends on the vaccine uh, uh, producer. So far, we have one uh, one vaccine registered in the country under user permit. So it's as a it's a killed vaccine. So basically, it is after uh, twelve weeks. So okay. it depends on the manufacturer's recommendation. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And the box, uh, and the box question. Uh, you have seen the whether the foul pox vaccine could be in, uh, given to the pigeon. Someone else has asked this. Uh, that of course I don't have much information on that uh, uh, because I don't have experience on that. I have check. I think that some other experts here also can advise. Dr. Gamla, do you have any experience of vaccine foul pox to the pigeons? Yeah. Yeah, Dylan, I, I have little experience, but uh, for the pigeons, of course, actually, we don't we don't we don't have I mean you know recommended oh I mean uh, Schedules of vaccines here in Sri Lanka, no? Or usually we give yeah. in the field level the normal commercial vaccines for them also as well, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, since there are no vaccines available, especially for them, we usually practice giving them also as well. Yeah, I think, well, you, except chicken anemia virus vaccines, others are okay because the host is only chicken for chicken anemia. So others are actually okay. foul and uh, is, because the, it depends on the host. So only this out of the disease, most of I mean, we discussed here, the chicken anemia virus is host is specific, like it's chicken, gallus gallus. Uh, so, uh, I find other than that, we there won't be any, I think, critical issue, according to the, I mean, I mean, uh, by perspective of the vaccine and the virus. Hello, sir. Yeah. Hello, yeah. sir. Um, uh, yeah. I'm Dr. Lakna. So, um, yeah. Dr. Dishnaka brought up a nice thing that, uh, I mean, actually we are, I mean, under practical situation, we are encountering that one. Uh, I mean, uh, when we think about the DAPH, we have some kind of vaccination, I mean, vaccination protocol is there. But the, the, the actually the practical situation, you know, that some other organization like Divisional Secretariat, uh, you know, that those officers are delivering that one based on their ministry. So, I mean, I, I think that they are not following those things because they are not having any link with the DAPH. No? So I need to ask that, is there any possibility that um, we can create some kind of and because uh, that if the vaccination, if the, that virus is not controlled, so the problem will in the future will be, you know, critical, no? So that's a, due to that reason. Is there any possibility that uh, at least SLV can create some kind of proper vaccination schedule for the, especially for the backyard for that one? Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Lakna. Yeah, that's very good. Actually, I think we should have, uh, proposing a vaccination program is not the fact. I think implementation part is, will be vital uh, because uh, through the DAPH to uh, range VS, uh, they should have the proper information and the facilities and the vaccines to uh, cater. Uh, so uh, that could be an idea, but I think we should have some kind of central um, uh, coordination on this uh, uh, work and all. Then we will have better grab, grip on it because uh, otherwise, it will like you know, uh, just uh, uh, distributing checks and uh, other things will not enhance the you know the availability of the uh, pro quality protein in the in the in the, in the rural uh, people. So that the health aspect and the uh, some in the productivity aspect we have to think about, and it should uh, coordinate to the central body. That's my suggestion actually.
need to uh introduce more vaccines because uh, they they are exposed to more other diseases okay. and uh, depends on the area you using yeah, yeah in the area and the the age that they are going to i mean some the game birds and all the they are you know they try to keep them more, more than like uh, 55 60 80 weeks yes yeah. so yeah. They, with the time the immunity also drops and we need to boost it and those kind of thing we have to think at it's similar to the pattern we adapt to the commercial environment but with the understanding of the disease burden and the immunity of the host and the mechanism behind it otherwise we can go along with the commercial one no yeah yeah that's the best so, do you recommend another another third uh, vaccine vaccine for them if so third, what which, they uh, live or kill pare Live, no, live vaccine or kill vaccine? No, if, if we are going for the second or third, then uh, it's not necessary to go for the live, no? Kill, kill would be fine, no? Yeah, normally uh, you start with the live and timing with the kill would be fine, but uh, so, no, if they are going to go or uh, keep more than 50 weeks, they are, it's better to give another kill vaccine. Yeah, when you would recommend, doctor? It's after, it depends on the burden, doctor. I think yeah, the commercial, we recommend... Yeah, it's we commercial we, if we for layers. If they are going to extend the life or the period more than 80 weeks, uh, so we recommend to uh, you a vaccine around 50 to 60 between 50 to 60 weeks. Then the kill. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, are there any questions? Any more questions? Mm. If not, uh, I think it's now three o'clock. Uh, it's exactly the time you uh, plan to finish this. And uh, I think it's a very good and interesting session we had with uh, Dr. Dilan, who is a very expert in poultry industry. And uh, with that, uh, to conclude this session, uh, to say thank you, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Sugat Pemachandra. Uh, before that, uh, Dr. Diran, do you have to say a few words or take home message or any? Uh, few, yeah, I um, think uh, thank you so much you for the we giving the opportunity and uh, thank you so much for the, all the veterinarians in, uh, participated. I think um, we as veterinarians uh, look at we should look at the uh, uh, economical aspect of the entrepreneurs irrespective of their you know scale of operation and go for this uh, protective type of uh, you know uh, veterinary interventions uh, rather than you know uh, have facade kind of uh, medications and the vaccines uh, introduced in the production system so that's my <coughs> message actually thank you so much for, uh, for your time and the uh, uh, time and listening to the session Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dilan. Uh, now I'm moving to Dr. Sugat Premachandra, Secretary of SLVA, uh, for his word of thanks. Thank you. Sugat, how about you? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Disnaka, uh, Dr. Randi Gunawardena, the President of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, uh, Dr. Dilan Satarzinga, today our resource person, dear doctors, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, uh, I would like uh, I take this opportunity to extend our most sincere gratitude to Dr. Dilan Satarsinha, uh, who accepted our uh, invitation uh, despite his uh, busy schedule. Uh, I think uh, the knowledge he shared with us improved immensely our uh, skills of the veterinarian in Sri Lanka. And also, I would like to say uh, participants today, over 100 from Sri Lanka, and uh, few uh, doctors from the different part of the world are uh, going to the uh, webinar today. I'm happy to say about it. 
and also i would like to thank dr sunil disnaker uh, our moderator today uh, you did a great job uh, as as well as i would like to thank uh, all the doctors who participated today student uh, professors uh, who participated today to make this workshop a success thank you